So some of the things that we found through all of this exploration was startling. Now, now keep in mind, we were engaging with the non-negotiables. So our primary uh, pattern of operating was that the minute we found, the minute we decided to operate with something, usually we used a contrarian approach. We tried first the thing that was most opposite to the thing we were trying to play with. So if students are used to sitting down, we made them stand up. If they're used to writing notes, we don't write notes. If they're used to having our, their questions answered, we don't answer questions. In some of these cases, that ended up being actually a very effective strategy. In other cases, we had to make modifications. But our initial move was almost always to give or to, to, to move in the direction that was as much contra contrary to the initial way we were doing things. So here are some of the things we learned from this process. So it turns out that there are different types of problems, and some problems are better than others. And we want to actually begin our lessons with good problems. Now, what defines good problems, I will talk a little bit more about later. But it turns out that what defines a good problem for the first six lessons of a year is quite different from what the, defines a good problem once a culture has started to build. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> How we give problems. This one was actually quite striking. It turns out that the absolute best way we could give a problem is verbally. When we give problems orally, students are driven immediately to discussion, whereas when we give them in any form of written text, they spend most of their time decoding. It creates a very different type of behavior among students. Um, and part of the results of this when we were testing was that oral worked out to be much better than written. And of the written forms, textbook was at the absolute worst form of written text for students to extract problems from. Workbooks were a little bit better. Worksheets were in the, mesh, math, in the mess there. What was written on boards or projected on projectors was a little bit better, but orally was by far better. Now, this doesn't always work because we can't say a quadratic. But one of the things that we learned was that we could write up a quadratic or we could write up an equation but the actual instructions as to what to do with it was stated orally. When it came to word problems, they were all verbal. And this turned out to be much, much more effective. How we answer questions. Well, it turns out that students only ask three types of questions. In our efforts to try to understand how best to answer questions, we spent a lot of time looking at what types of questions students ask. And it turns out they only ask three types. The first type is something called a proximity question. Proximity questions are questions students ask just because you happen to be standing close to them. Um, they don't actually need you to answer this. They wouldn't put up their hand. They wouldn't walk over to ask this question. But it's a very student-y thing to do when you're close to the teacher. The most student-y thing a student can do is to ask a question. And the most teacherly thing a teacher can do is to answer that question. So that's the first type of question. The second type of question students ask is called a, uh, a stop thinking question. Stop thinking questions are usually of the form, is this right? Or is this going to be on the test? These are the questions students ask to allow them to drop into a lower energy level. The third type of questions students ask are called keep thinking questions. These are usually clarifying questions. They usually don't stick around for you to give the whole explanation. They really just want to get back to the work. And one of the things that the research showed was that we need to stop answering proximity questions and stop thinking questions. And in fact, those are probably some of the things that contribute the most to learned helplessness is our continual answering of, of proximity and stop thinking questions. The key thinking questions, however, were the types of questions we wanted to answer. The thing we learned about room organization, and again, this was ironic, is the, the rooms that were the most engaging for students were the rooms that were the most chaotic. Now, I'm not talking about mess and paper and dirt everywhere. I'm talking about rooms that didn't have a perceivable front, rooms where students sat in every direction. And I can go into the research as to why that is, but the bottom line is 
that students behave differently when there isn't a discernible front. They're not trying to conform to order and they, they free themselves a little bit more. How, we, how groups are formed? It turns out that the best way to form groups is randomly. And that was by far the best way. It, it was better than any strategic efforts that teachers came up with. And I'm going to talk more about that in detail in a minute. Student workspace, for those of you who have followed my work, are not surprised that the best student workspace is vertical non-permanent surfaces. But I want to point out that this is just one of many results that came out of this research. And I am going to talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Autonomy. We want to give students autonomy. And I'm not going to go too much into this right now. But it turns out that there's a huge difference between giving students autonomy to make decisions and actually pushing them into that autonomous space and forcing them to make decisions within that autonomous space. It turns out that just giving autonomy is like opening up a hole in the floor. The students will skirt around this hole and not actually step into it. Whereas, and what we really need is to get the students to seize on autonomy, to, to grapple with ambiguity, to make decisions for themselves. And I will talk a little bit more about what that looks like. How we give notes. The first thing we tried was not to do notes at all. And it actually worked incredibly well. The research I was doing showed that very, very few students are actually actively engaged while they're writing notes, about 50%. But we never found a single class where more than five students would use their notes after they had written them. Not one class had more than five students. Usually the number was three. So we stopped doing notes. And, and it actually worked really well, except for those three students who sort of panicked. Um, but of late, we've been playing a lot with this notion of mindful notes. And it ties very strongly into autonomy. What do the students see as important? What do they want to write down? And of course, younger kids need more scaffolding. Older kids need to have more autonomy. But the bottom line is they have to be mindful about what it is they write. And notes happen after activity. The activity is not notes. Hints and extensions. Uh, I've latched strongly onto Csikszentmihalyi's theory of flow, which comes from psychology. And this notion that the best way to keep students engaged is to keep them within a balance of challenge and ability. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that. There is a lot of re literature I've written that's coming out on that soon. But it's, um, it's probably the most powerful and effective thing we learned from this research is how to build engagement through flow. But there's, there's a caveat that comes with that that I will talk about in a minute. Um, leveling to the bottom. We're used to leveling to the top students in the room and trying to lift the, the lower level students up to this level. And again, this is a very nuanced thing. The four purposes of assessment really emerged strongly from this research. And again, I don't have time to talk about everything. But aside from these results that emerged from these 11 variables, we started to play with which ones are the most powerful and which ones are the easiest for a teacher to implement. One of the goals of this research was not to develop, not only to develop effective practices, but practices that teachers could pick up easily. So there were other things that emerged around journaling, for example, that was almost impossible for teachers to pick up. One of the things we learned from this, however, was that not all of these tools were equally powerful. So for example, if you go into your classroom tomorrow and the only thing you do is don't answer questions, you're not going to have a good day. These tools organize themselves into clusters, into hierarchies of most effect and ease of implementation. And it looks like this. You start at the top, the top set of tools, beginning with good problems, using vertical non-permanent surfaces, and form visibly random groups, are the three easiest tools to implement. They're also the three most impactful tools. So and I think many of you have discovered this who are trying to play with vertical surface, non-permanent surfaces or, perm, or playing with visibly random groups. You're probably seeing a relatively large effect size. 
But these are not the only three tools. The next set of tools is the way we use oral instructions, defront the room, only answer key thinking questions, and the way we build autonomy in our classroom. And in an ideal implementation where implementation is done thoroughly and with fidelity, that would come about three weeks after initial implementation. And the last set of tools is leveling to the bottom, using hints and extension to manage uh, flow, using mindful notes and the four purposes of assessment. The four purposes of assessment almost sit outside of this in their own sort of journey. But again, these come after development has happened. And this developmental model is not just for the teacher who's trying to get used to doing things differently. They're also for the students who are trying to learn or tr resisting learning in some cases, what it means to be a thinking student in a thinking classroom. We can't pounce on these things right away. We need to m build it in slower. When teachers become more experienced, they're able to do it more and more all at the same time. Now, <clears throat> Laura Wheeler has just finished a really wonderful sketch note that represents this entire model. And I got it just in time to include it in this PowerPoint. But it's a really nice visual summarization of what this journey is. And the articles exist that if you want the backstop on all of the nuances about this. And I have one that I've written recently that is especially for teachers, uh, minus some of the boring research. But it, it, and it articulates each of these a little bit more thoroughly. Mm -hmm.